Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all of you. Welcome to lightning session number four, using cutting edge tools in conservation science. Uh, this is going to be a very exciting uh, uh, meeting. There will be 12 talks, 11 or 12, but I think 12 even. And um, afterwards there will be question and answers. And I'm Franz Bonger from the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands. I've been working in many, many countries in the tropics as well. So I'm happy to be here and happy to, to try to moderate this session with you in, in the question and answers. Um, I would like to ask you to put any questions you may have in the question and answer in the Zoom. So not in the, in the WUBA, but in the Zoom. Um, and then we will look at that and we'll come back to you uh, later on. You also, uh, yes, that I think, think that's fine. Uh, the other thing is uh, what I would like to ask you is please turn off your cameras when the uh, the presentations are running. That makes it easier for people to concentrate on the presentations. Um, and if you have a question in the question and answer, please indicate to whom you would like to ask the question. Sometimes it's a general question, but but it's mu it's much more easy if you are specific on person A or person B. I would like to ask this question. Um, we have 12, person, 12 people, and I would like to quickly uh, introduce them to you. That is Yidan Fan from Japan, so from, from many different countries. Tatiana Maida from the USA, United States of America. Yao Fang Chan from China. Sarah Rodi from the United Kingdom. Augusti Randi from Singapore. Joana Paula da Silva Oliveira from Brazil. Scott Dregesser from the United States of America. Charles Willis from the United States. Uh, Matt Ward from the Philippines, Farhadur Rahman from Japan, um, Guillermo McFerrero Dolande from the Philippines, and Clarol Raubelina from Madagascar. So that's a, that's a wide range of people, and they're going to, to share their exciting work with us. And I think that is it. The uh, video will be started now. Thank you very much, and enjoy the coming hour. Hello, my name is Yi Dan Fan from Hiroshima University, Japan. Today I'm going to talk about preference of tourists towards biodiversity in tropical rainforests, a global scale assessment using social media data. Tourism in tropical rainforests has a potential to contribute to conservation by providing tourists with opportunities to directly interact with biodiversity and raising their awareness for conservation. However, it is also has been pointed out that the major objective of tourists in tropical rainforests is activities such as camping, trekking, and boating, and they may not be interested in observation of biodiversity except for large-bodied mammals and birds. If this is the case, tourism in tropical rainforests may have little impacts on conservation awareness for tourists and there is no systematic and global scale study on what tourists enjoy and appreciate in tropical rainforests. And social media data can be used for this purpose. We conducted photo content analysis using Flickr. The objective of the study is to use social media data to understand tourist preference towards biodiversity in global tropical rainforests. We assume that photos that tourists taken can reflect their preferences. Specifically, we focus on three research questions. Are human activity photos dominated rather than biodiversity photos? Here, biodiversity photos means flora and fauna as main subject of the photo. Among biodiversity photos, are mammals and bird photos dominated rather than other biodiversity such as arthropods, reptiles, amphibians, plants, and mushrooms? And are there differences in photo content among different continents? We mined publicly available photos uploaded on Flickr during 2010 to 2019 for 25 
popular protected areas in the tropical rainforest around the world. We randomly sampled 1,000 photos for each area, and totally 25,000 photos were classified manually based on their contents. Photos are six main categories about diversity, human activity, landscape, food, posing, and infrastructure. Contrary to our expectation, the proportion of biodiversity photos were significantly higher than that of activity photos in the 25 protected areas. Among biodiversity elements, the proportion of photos of mammals and birds was high as our expectation. Interestingly, arthropods and plants were high and not significantly different from mammals and birds. We also found differences in contents of biodiversity photos. Birds were popular in Central and South America, while large-bodied mammals were common in Africa. Asia has no clear pattern. Our results indicated that biodiversity was highly appreciated by tourists, even though Tourist's major objective might have been other recreational activities or observing charismatic large-bodied mammals. They were also interested in and impressed by other biodiversity that they encountered in the forest. Biodiversity, including insects and plants, attract many tourist interests in tropical rainforests, especially in America and Asia. And many protected areas usually provide flora and fauna statistics in general, but no detailed introduction. And vertebrates, especially mammals, are promoted more than invertebrates. However, in reality, most tourists encounter plants and other mammals more rather than only mammals in the rainforest. So more information and education on the plants and non-mammalian mammals should be offered to tourists so that it can enrich tourists' experience and raise their conservation awareness. Thank you for your attention. My name is Tatiana Maida, and I'm a graduate researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'll be talking about spatial or temporal sampling, assessing diversity levels in a Borneo rainforest using bioacoustics. Biodiversity surveys are often restricted to spatial data collection of one taxonomic group in one season, which limits our understanding of biodiversity patterns. But what could we possibly miss by sampling over space only? Do different taxonomic groups respond to impacts differently or similarly? Using passive acoustic recorders, we wanted to answer this main question. What is the difference between alpha, beta, and gamma diversity of all vocalizing taxonomic groups captured by spatial and temporal sampling with and without selective logging? And we synchronously recorded all the sounds in a landscape at 15 mature forest sites in East Kalimantan, Indonesia, once a month for an entire year. So for this spatial sampling, we randomly selected one minute during the dawn and sampled this minute for all the 15 sites. For temporal sampling, we have a group of never logged forest sites and a site that was selectively logged for the first time during the recording period. And we sampled um, for these both temporal groups, a dawn and a dusk minute every month for a year for both uh, temporal groups. And using these visual graphs that are organized by frequency and time, I manually labeled all the animal sounds in each one minute sample. And I used the number of different sonotypes or unique 
vocalizations as a proxy of species richness of birds, insects, mammals, and amphibians. I annotated more than 3,000 3, vocalizations and birds and insects accounted for most of the annotations. Some preliminary results are that for birds, we found a similar number of sonotypes per minute for both samplings, the temporal and spatial sampling. Um, so a similar alpha diversity, but sampling over time yielded a greater accumulation of different bird sonotypes so a higher gamma diversity than sampling over space. And we found the opposite for insects. There was also no difference um, between the number of sonotypes per group, but sampling over space yielded a greater accumulation of different insect sonotypes than sampling over time. So when comparing the sonotypes captured by each sampling, we found a low overlap between the two samplings for birds, for birds and for insects. So for example, we found the rufous tail chama in both spatial and temporal, but we found the Borneo barbet and the great argus just in one of the samplings. So depending on the sampling method you choose, you will probably capture different species. Lastly, comparing the two temporal samplings, uh, the selective, selectively logged site in the yellow had a lower accumulation of bird sonotypes and a higher accumulation of insect sonotypes over time when compared to the never logged sites. We concluded that even in a low seasonality, tropical forest, the richness and composition of the vocalizing diversity vary greatly throughout the year. The complementarity from spatial and temporal sampling suggests that to truly understand the impacts of human activities on biodiversity, it is necessary to sample over both space and time. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Yu Fang Chen. Today I'm talking about acoustic index using in a frost plot of Southern China. Habitat loss, overexploitation, and other factors or decaminations can cause biodiversity loss. Several papers showing that species range get different level shrinkage, so large scale and long term monitoring is needed. Emerging technology and non-invasive methods are useful for monitoring on animal or species, uh, plant species. Remote sense, camera check, passive acoustic monitoring is persuasive in research. Species identification in research is in commonplace, but it's limited by expertise or rely on machine learning methods. But acoustic index can give us a chance to bypass these problems. The fundamental assumption is more, speci more species, more complex acoustic signals. We can do biodiversity research on this vegetation plot. The exist vegetation plot always get fully surveyed. So how can we integrate this information with that on animal sound? We use autonomous technology. It can help prevent damage from trampling of observers. Some vegetation plots are span across a large area that can detect different effects on animal communities. Especially valuable information is tree species richness. So our research question is which variable are affecting acoustic index in landscape and vegetation related environment? Elevation, vegetation structure, or tree species diversity? According to previous literature, we hypothesis that elevation is the strong variable affecting biodiversity, following by vegetation structure and tree species diversity. This is our study site. We study in seven natural reserves in Guangxi. 
We use canopy high tree density vertical heterogeneity and tree species diversity as vegetation data. We record sound three times per day, but we only use morning and evening data. And we mainly identified some recordings and we found that morning is dominant by birds and evening is dominant by insects. This is the seven acoustic index we use in our statics. We use generalized linear mix model. Here we show full model. Acoustic index as responsible variables. And then we use more and I test to check the spatial or the correlation. After that, we use model averaging. This is our main result. The left table is a little bit complicated, so we can see the right table. So we found that three significant negative relationship with elevation, one negative relationship with vertical heterogeneity, and one positive relationship with tree species diversity. I have to mention that AEI is always uh, opposite direction with ADI, so he showed positive fear, but it's negative. Evening is similar result, similar to the morning result. You can see that three significant relationship, negative relationship with elevation, one positive relationship with vertical heterogeneity. In our result, both two taxa decrease with elevation increase. The same result as Peter's shown here. Based on MacArthur's theory, greater heterogeneity in vertical structure leads to higher animal diversity. We found two significant relationships between acoustic index and vertical heterogeneity. NDSI positive, ADI negative. For tree species diversity, we got interesting finding, but in surprising taxa, we hypothesis that insect cell would be affected by tree species diversity because insects tend to be more host specific. We also found that H had the strongest relationship. ADI, AEI, and NDSI together had the next strongest relationship. ACI, AR, and BIO was not significantly related to any of the predictor variable we test. Finally, I want to thank my supervisor, give me a lot of health in my Lamex. And also thank to three fundings. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Rowley and I'm a Masters by Research student at the University of Salford, working in collaboration with Adria Lopez Bussiles, Ricardo Rocha and Christoph Mayer. I'm studying the interplay between local and landscape scale variables in shaping aerial insectivorous bat responses across a fragmented Amazonian landscape. Land use change is the main driver of the, bio, the global biodiversity crisis. It's estimated that between 1980 and 2012, more than 150 million hectares of tropical forest was converted for agricultural use. However, some of this land, and in particular the land cleared for cattle grazing, are typically abandoned after a few years, and this gives forests an opportunity to regenerate. This trend of abandoned cattle pastures and regenerated forest is now a significant feature of the Brazilian Amazon, with 22% of deforested land being occupied by second growth forests. These secondary forests do have the capacity to help preserve biodiversity, so it's important to understand how species respond to changes in the local habitat quality and fragmentation of the wider landscape. Bats are excellent indicators of the overall health and the level of disturbance within neotropical forests. And whilst there has been a lot of research on the responses of phylostomid bats to habitat loss and fragmentation, limited research has been done on aerial insectivorous bats. My study aims to provide a holistic perspective of how local and landscape scale variables shape aerial insectivorous bat responses to fragmentation by jointly investigating three biodiversity facets, taxonomic, functional and phylogenetic. Additionally, I will investigate the scale dependency of the relationships between those diversity facets and the local and landscape metrics. All data was collected at the BDFFP. This study area consists of various forest fragments, continuous forest, and study sites in the intervening matrix, which were originally used as cattle pastures, but abandoned and now feature secondary regrowth forests of varying age and species composition. This figure shows how the various forest types and fragments blend together. This background photo gives you an idea of what the secondary forest now looks like. 
The BDFFP is a landscape with relatively low structural contrast. 33 sites were sampled in total, eight within the forest fragment and nine interior control sites in the primary forest. I analysed around 280,000 calls from 20 species and five families. I calculated the diversity metrics or response variables through hill numbers selecting an inverse Simpson metric. I submitted local vegetation data, which was collected from each of the sample sites, the principal component analysis, and retained the scores on the first axes. Using satellite images of the BDFFP, I've quantified compositional and configurational aspects of the landscape structure and calculated three landscape metrics at six focal scales which range from 500 metres up to three kilometres. I've created a set of 11 candidate models based on ecologically plausible combinations of local vegetation structure and landscape predictor metrics, whereby each model includes a random term accounting for the nested sampling design. In order to investigate local and landscape relationships with the three diversity response metrics, the most parsimonious models were selected and a 95% confidence set created. Model averaging for the best model calculated parameter estimates and hierarchical partitioning determined the variation independently explained by each of the predictor variables. This figure shows a summary of the model averaging results. There are subtle scale sensitive associations for all three diversity facets with local and landscape scale metrics and most of the variables seem to be having a negative effect on diversity. So even though we're dealing with a landscape with low structural contrast, we can still see that the three diversity facets are affected by local and landscape scale habitat attributes in a scale dependent manner. Moving forward and away from the community perspective, my next task is to assess ensemble and species specific responses by analysing bat activity and I will be again looking for relationships from a scale dependency perspective. So just to say thank you to everyone involved in this wider project, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Hi, I would like to present uh, our activity in Indonesia. I am Agusti Randi and my two colleagues Vitro Alhani and Campbell Oweb also contribute equally to this presentation. The title is Liberating Social Media Posts of Plant Observations in Indonesia. In Indonesia, social media has become one of the primary ways to share plant knowledge because of the wide use of smartphones and their social media apps and also because the informality of online groups encourages the asking of questions. One of the most active forums about plants in Indonesia is a plant community, a Facebook group started in 2012, and now a community of 2,300 members with various backgrounds, but only less than 5% of the members have a botanical background. The rest are general public, like uh, uh, students, plant lovers, even a merchant or policeman. This proves that the enthusiasm of the general public in Indonesia for the botany is quite large. And today, more than uh, 3,000 posts in the Facebook groups, uh, great growth, uh, both photos in discussions. Uh, several times each day, photos of plants are shared, commented, and identified. The observations are often of a rare species or fertile individuals with high quality of photographs, uh, making this a unique, valuable record of the plant's diversity in Indonesia. Despite its benefits as a forum, a Facebook group is, however, a poor repository for storing information. The images are logged into a corporate silo, not accessible by the internet public, all the posts are no longer findable. Facebook also doesn't work as a reference resource. Aware of uh, these limitations, uh, we began an effort to rescue the images and metadata before they were completely lost. And then uh, we repost them to a public website and database. 
we look into automated ways to extract the post using the Facebook API, but in the end, we choose a process of manual, like uh, downloading images, reading the comments one by one, uploading uh, images to the website, uh, and recording metadata based on original post, like uh, auto, death, location, determination for the IDs, and the terminator. The project was strongly supported by members of the group who had created the images. This is the homepage of the website, uh, indonesiaplantscommunity.org, same name because the website is sourced from the FB group, Plants Community. The main reason is uh, to make all data in the Facebook group searchable more widely and permanently. Just a simple website, everyone can do exploration on it. For the example, I try to click in, uh, on the plant database there, and then uh, it will look like this. And everyone also can sort by species, by poster, by determination. Or can use search box. For the example, I search uh, genus Durio here. And then it will look like this. All data about Dorio that we have will appear. And try to click one of them. And then all information detail about the Dorio will be shown like uh, more photographs, poster, the date, yeah, original post on the Facebook, determination and determiner. You also can click the photographs for full screen view. Then we move to Google search engine when I try to search one species like Durio cutagensis and now it's searchable. Until May 2021, almost 3,000 observations belonging to 906 different genera from across Indonesia have been transferred to their websites uh, going back to February 2012. Besides uh, Facebook posts, the repository can store any plant observations and we are in the process of adding other collections of images from community member. Uh, finally, through this website, all metadata fields are searchable. Thank you very much uh, for ATBC and thank you very much for Indonesian plant community. Hi, my name is Joana Paula Oliveira, and I'm a graduate student at the Federal University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. And today I'll present to you my project called Biomiteca Atlantic Forest, a digital library of omics and biogeographic data to promote the valorization and conservation of this biodiversity hotspot. The Atlantic Forest is a priority conservation target. It has already been referred to as the hottest hotspot for its high levels of species richness, especially endemic ones being associated with the forest cover loss. Such cover loss leads to biome fragmentation, which is a huge obstacle to conservation efforts. Though this may not look so good, innovative strategies can lead the Atlantic Forest from being a hotspot to a hope spot. So how can we scientists and data analysts assist on achieving that goal? If we look to the Atlantic Forest plant biodiversity as ecosystem services, which means appraising species not only by means of their intrinsic value, but also by their bioeconomic potential. What we are doing is actually giving the opportunity for landowners and traditional communities for a sustainable cultivation of threatened species within their own environment. And at the same time, they can take advantage of their bioeconomic value. This is when bioprospection comes into play. It acts on the search for chemotypes and natural compounds with potential for agricultural application, as well as to serve as models for nutritional and medicinal industries. And there are many ways to optimize bioprospection, but to us, the integration of two techniques seem to make a lot of sense. They are metabolomics and species distribution modeling. We can look at liquid chromatography coupled with tandem mass spectrometry, as a puzzle of molecules fragmentation patterns that, if put together, can result in the discovery of drastically important biomolecules. Species distribution modeling, in its turn, can help us understand the potential distribution and adaptability of species that produce those aforementioned important compounds. 
Altogether, combining results can render prosperous perspectives that fulfill both conservational and economic demands. So we came up with the idea of an online platform called Biomitech Atlantic Forest, which will gather metabolomics data in the form of mass spectra identified within species of the Atlantic Forest, associated with maps of models of their potential distribution and adaptability. The platform will be freely available to the public, to producers interested in sustainable cultivation and to politicians involved in conservation sectors. At first, we selected three orchid species to be showcased in this manner within the platform. Those are Certopodium gluteniferum and two species of vanilla of the Atlantic Forest. As preliminary results from metabolomics, we identified molecules in Certopodium gluteniferum that show high antioxidative action. Though this species is already used in folk medicine, the presence of such kinds of molecules may justify its use in pharmaceutical industries. From species distribution modeling of the species, we've learned that the current network of protected areas covers mostly low environmental suitability areas and that potential occurrence hotspots might not be protected under any legal sphere of conservation areas. The online platform is under construction. The user registration and the species and molecules queries functionalities are almost finished. External collaborators will be able to fill up a form and send their own data to enrich the platform. Though the platform is still only in Portuguese, it will be also translated to English and ethnobiological information of those species will be also available. As future perspectives, we intend to feed the platform with all the results from our study and massively spread the word about the Biomitech Atlantic Forest so that other researchers can contribute with their own data and interested parts can take advantage of the information therein published. I wrap it up by thanking all the institutions somehow involved in the development of this project, especially my crew from the Integrated Laboratory of Plant Science at UniHU. I'll be available to answer any questions you may have, and thanks for the attention. Hey everybody, I want to talk to you about a new nonprofit initiative from the Biodiversity Group called Connect and Conserve. Who am I? I'm Scott Tregesser. I am a conservation biologist and photographer. I am the founder of Connect and Conserve. I'm the executive director and president of the Biodiversity Group and the director and co-founder of the Creative Conservation Alliance. And through these diverse experiences I've had, I've identified a few uh, gaps and um, needs within the conservation sector that I've decided to address through the Biodiversity Group, and one of which is Connect and Conserve. So at its very core, Connect and Conserve is simply a database aggregating information from all conservation organizations around the world. Uh, inf information such as revenue and expenditures, what species they're working on, where are they working on it, how are they working on it. Now, this information is easy, isn't easy to come by, which is why it hasn't been done before now. And we're providing this data freely through informative dashboards to anybody who's interested, including the general public, governments, or other conservationists. So as you can imagine, this is extremely important data that hasn't been available up until now. And with it, we can finally do a holistic and objective analysis of the conservation sector. Uh, for instance, currently, if we're trying to estimate conservation funding, uh, we extrapolate from protected area management funding. And that's a very rough estimate. While useful, um, we, this suit will supersede this and provide a much better resolution on what, uh, what we're doing and what we're not doing. Uh, for the biodiversity group, this is extremely important because we focus on conserving life overlooked, which is these species that are being underserved in places that are being underserved. Uh, and right now we can't objectively define that, but with this data, we, we finally will be able to. Not only that, but we can actually connect uh, not only conservationists with other conservationists, but conservationists with donors and funders, such as the general public. Uh, the general public, if you ask them where to donate right now, they simply don't know most of the time, or if they do, it's to one of the you know, five bingos, the big NGOs. Uh, so this will democratize public donations to smaller NGOs and uh, be able to serve the public in a better way. So if they actually, if they want to specifically fund a specific animal, such as aardvarks or tree kangaroos or what have you, they will be able to easily go to this website, find the organization in the place that they want to be protecting in the way that they want to protect it. They want it through con community conservation, through research, they can find that and they can use the site as a donation portal to that organization. We've actually made significant progress towards these goals already. Connectandconserve.org, the alpha version has been deployed. It's not citable yet, though we've included nearly 6,000 organizations from around the world and their associated data. 
data such as what species they're conserving, how they're conserving it, where they're conserving it, and how much money is being spent to conserve these species. Uh, this data has not been available prior, and so this is actually really exciting progress. Not only that, we've also mapped U.S.-based expenditures per country. Uh, which, since the U.S. has the most, the highest philanthropic contributions of any country in the world, this is a significant milestone in our eventual goal to map all conservation expenditure and revenue data around the world. If you manage a conservation organization, your public data is likely represented on this database. We would encourage you to go to your organizational profile and validate the data so that we can represent you in the most, most truthful manner. We're constantly improving our scraping and data curation abilities, but there are gonna be errors in the data as, as this is an alpha version. Um, as we improve the curation abilities, we will be publishing the data so that we can make citable actions in the conservation sector. As you can imagine, the Biodiversity Group is extremely excited to offer this to the conservation community. I hope you're excited to receive it. This is first and foremost a initiative by conservationists for conservationists. Uh, if you manage a conservation organization, please go validate your data on the website. It doesn't take long. We want to represent you as accurately as possible so the results are as accurate as possible so we can make informed decisions. Uh, please also, if you can just peruse the website, suggest any organizations which we may have missed, which we most certainly have, uh, or if you have any constructive criticisms, ideas, or networks to connect us with, we're very open to any of this and it's super helpful. Um, if you can go on the website and see what kind of technical support we need, re currently require or any operational support that you can uh, provide. Now, like I said, this is a nonprofit initiative. It's operating under the umbrella of the Biodiversity Group, and you can always reach out to me at scott at biodiversitygroup.org. Thanks for coming. In this video, I'm going to be covering changes that we have made to a pre-existing lab to make it fully online and open source to improve student access to really engaging with tropical ecology research. So the lab itself is called Snapshot Serengeti, and we've been doing it for several years here at the University of Minnesota. It is a five week long lab that takes students all the way from asking a individual unique question to analyzing that question, doing peer review, and finally writing their own individual report or giving an oral presentation. It's based on this uh, ongoing research project called Snapshot Serengeti, which is a camera trap system, one of many across Africa, that collects thousands of pictures a year, and those pictures are then annotated using a citizen science platform. So we consider it a cure because students participate in that citizen science process, contributing data to an ongoing research project, then use data from that research project to ask their own or answer their own questions related to tropical ecology and animal behavior. A limitation, however, is the software we use. So it is proprietary, meaning it's hard to export this to other institutions, and it's also uh, very complicated for students to learn how to use it to answer the questions they want to answer. So it leads to frustration among students. And then when we moved remotely because of the pandemic, it was really hard to get this software installed on all of their computers and working compatibly. So we recognized that there was a serious problem with a fundamental piece of this lab. But fortunately, along comes the Ocelots Group, which is an NSF-funded working group focused on the creation, adaptation, and dissemination of tropical biology labs activities that are fully online uh, and are data data rich. So as part of that, we took Snapshot Sangari as a trial run to build a fully open source interface to give students at once that fully interactive experience of actually analyzing real data from a research project, but also not leaving them frustrated or confused with how to actually import and uh, graph that data. To do that, we jettisoned Jump for our Shiny and built our own unique R Shiny modules, and we put everything on this very streamlined online platform called Gala. And that's what my co-presenter Jeff is going to talk to you about now. Thanks, Charlie. The Gala platform, available at LearnGala.com, presents case studies in sustainability from around the globe and covering a wide range of topics. Taking a look at the Gala version of Snapshot Serengeti, we see that content is arranged in chapters in a table of contents. Within each chapter, Gala uses cards that accompany the main text and contain links or external resources that can deliver supplementary or background information. We use these cards as containers for interactives written in the R Shiny language and which were connected to and allowed for interactive plotting of the Snapshot Serengeti dataset. We paired these interactives with text questions, 
with the overall goal to provide students with a highly scaffolded framework for learning about how different visualizations can be used to investigate different classes of scientific question. The trade-off here is that students can't do the full set of data manipulations that they could perform with a statistical software package, which limits students' ability to formulate independent hypotheses. To address this, we created a data analysis dashboard that allows students to create and export plots based on the graph types they have already been introduced to and any of the species or response variables present in the data set. The great virtue of this approach is that we can deliver the lab as a single link and a PDF teacher's guide comprising an all-in-one package that students can use with no dependence on external software. Thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. So once we built the new Snapshot Serengeti lab, we decided to put it to the test. We debuted the lab at three different institutions, including Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson University, the University of Minnesota, and Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. Anecdotal responses from students and instructors who use the lab at all these institutions was very positive. Students were very excited about the lab. Uh, but we also surveyed students at the University of Minnesota to get more specific feedback. And in a, a series of questions that focused on their general interest in the lab and general appreciation for the lab. Over 65% of students said they enjoyed the lab overall. 68% of students uh, enjoyed uh, the online platform, so they liked the changes that we made to the online uh, version of the lab. And then more excitingly, uh, almost 60% of students found that the online tools were easy to use, uh, which I can tell you from experience in the old lab is a big increase. Uh, and then 76% of students found that the lab taught them new ways of thinking about data, which is really exciting because that's the point of the lab itself. So we feel that these are positive changes and we look forward to improving on them in the future. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Hello everyone, and welcome to Replacing Flesh and Bone with Wires and Chips. Specifically here, we're looking at technologies that are used in conservation to supplement or make up for human observers, not to replace them. Traditional fieldwork is often exhausting, time-consuming, and can require large teams to undertake even simple tasks. Modern technology, however, has been getting more involved in all aspects of science and everyday life, with conservation no different. So let's start with the humble drone. A technology that's gone from being used to spy on your international neighbors to spying on elusive wildlife. Drones are so accessible now, being found as often in toy stores as they are in science. Modern drones like this DJI Mavic are small enough to creep up on wildlife without startling them, covering hundreds of hectares in habitat assessments, and with features such as high definition and infrared cameras, they're helping to detect the most elusive species in dense forests or measure habitat health through mapping of canopy communities. We're even at a point now where the energy expensive task of radio tracking animals can be done quicker and over greater distances with the use of adapted drones. And discussing radio tracking, we look now at our wildlife monitoring techniques. When monitoring wildlife after reintroductions or studying their spatial ecology and behavior, we have often again relied on radio tags and the tracking to relocate the animal and take your important data on health and behavior can be very time consuming. Depending on your species and number of animals being tracked, this could be physically exhausting and more often than not requires large teams to take on the stress. Now we can track multiple animals using small tags and never break a sweat. Satellite tracking has been around for a while, but it's very expensive and often heavy with all the hardware needed inside the tags. Today, GPS lockers can be fitted with much lighter radio or GSM cell phone download options. These techniques allow your loggers to record GPS data at your pre-programmed time but that data is then downloaded from miles away via either a radio base station and a small antenna, similar to what you would use in radio tracking, or sent straight to you via a central server and the cell phone network all around you. This enables a team of three people to track half a dozen animals, even birds, with the tags doing all of your work. 
Finally, when you want to record detailed behavior of your animals, maybe group interactions or large numbers that you couldn't put transmitters on, you can always fall back on the ever-reliable camera traps. Camera traps or trail cameras are used extensively around the world in conservation for a variety of things, including species-specific behavior, habitat selection, or occupancy studies. For identifying threats in an area or assessing site suitability, or even just monitoring the native biodiversity of your area to see changes over time. The camera trap is your eyes in the forest, without you needing to be there, and as one of the other texts, is getting more sophisticated and conservation is friendly with the additions of wireless downloads, solar charging, and now we can combine the images from our camera traps with computer software. The development of photo ID software enables us to cut down the time sorting and analyzing our camera trap images by using the software to identify species and even individuals within your group. None of these items are going to replace people entirely, but at times when funds are restricted, personnel are lacking, or as we have recently seen, restrictions are in place on the movement of people, these technologies can help you with your project and an NGO, even with a skeleton staff, can continue to run a conservation initiative. Thank you all so much, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the day. Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. Today I'll be talking about uh, canopy height variation in relation to topography and vegetation type at landscape level. We derive the canopy height information, the topography information from airborne LiDAR scanning. The spatial variation of maximum canopy height are key driver of many ecosystem processes like the dynamics of carbon sequestration. So the researchers are always very uh, interested to know what creates the canopy height variation. The answer is pretty obvious, which is topography, at least at landscape scale. So the availability of high resolution topographic data possibly from the airborne LiDAR scanning will enable us to quantify the effect of fine scale topographic heterogeneity on the variation of canopy height at landscape scale. Here, we can see the schematic diagram of how, how the LiDAR scanning looks like and how we can derive the canopy height information as well as the ground elevation information from the airborne LiDAR scanning. So having such a wonderful data, we are interested to know how topographic feature influence tree height. But we are also interested to know how the other features like canopy gap position and the neighborhood tree density influence tree height. In order to answer this question, the study was conducted in the central Japan, which is Kyoto City. Our study area is around 230 square kilometer. And most of the trees of our study area are evergreen conifers and also plantation, which is also made from the evergreen conifers. So around 80% of the vegetation of our study area represent evergreen conifer species. So here we can see how a airborne LiDAR scanning looks like. It basically creates a 3D image of the forest. So we can very quickly get the ground elevation information as the primary feature. But from the ground elevation information, we can get some other secondary information like slope, aspect, topographic wetness, and curvature. And we can also get some other secondary features from the canopy height too. Like we can detect where there is any canopy gap like this and detect the number of trees in the neighborhood. So in our study area, we detected at least 14 million trees. So we use that half a million points from that 14 million trees to see the relationship between the canopy height and elevation. We found that the highest trees were found in the middle of the elevation range, which is 500 meter in our study area. We also found that the tree that grows on the valleys are taller than the tree that grows on the ridges. The reason may be the tree that grows on the valleys are enjoying more uh, water, nutrition, and protection from the wind than the tree that grows on the hill ridges. We also get a positive relationship bet uh, between canopy height and the distance from the gap, which means that uh, which means the tree that grows on the edges of the forest are shorter than the tree that grows in the middle of the stand. We also found 
the negative relationship between the canopy height and the number of trees in the neighborhood. We can see that the tree that grows in the high density are shorter than the tree that grows on the lower density. But the relationship is pretty prominent for the coniferous species. But the lines are flat are as not as prominent as the conifers for the broadleaf species. So we put all the information that we have and put it in the multivariate models. We found that the machine learning algorithm like random forest explained the most, which explained the 40% variation of the canopy height. So we also uh, saw the, the variable importance uh, in the random forest model. And we found that the topographic features are one of the important, but in addition to topographic features, like other factor like neighborhood tree density and distance from the gap also shapes the canopy height variation. In addition to topographic heterogeneity, canopy gap position and neighboring tree density drives canopy height. However, including all the variables can only describe 40% of the canopy height variation. So other factors like the stand age and soil drive the canopy height variation at landscape scale. Our study is conducted in the temperate region, which is Japan, but uh, studying in Japan enable us to see the possibility and the uses of this cutting technology in other areas like the tropical areas where the forests are very inaccessible too. For example, here we can see how the lighter scanning image looks uh, in the broadleaf forest too. So along with the conifers, it also can give some useful information about the broadleaf forest too. That's all for my presentation. I would like to uh, invite you to ask questions if you have any. Thank you very much for listening. Many species have dimson patterns or marking for camouflage or display of pigments. In many of these cases, however, these seemingly random or simple patterns are distinctive to the individual. Whether the distinction is visible to the species itself is unknown, but using this variation in patterns is useful for identifying individuals for research and conservation purposes. Rusa alfredi is a medium sized deer endemic to the West Asian Pano region of the Philippines. Only remaining in the island of Negros and Panay, it is currently endangered. With the exact numbers unknown. Talarak Foundation has been captive breeding and managing Russell Freddy on Negros Island since 2010. Talarak has launched the first reintroduction program at the Napa Nature Reserve in Bayawan City, Negros Island, creating a new population of semi wild deer with access for monitoring and research studies. Several of these individuals will be monitored through telemetry colors, however, the majority of the animals will remain without leaving camera traffic as an important tool for monitoring the health and growth of this population. Recognizing individuals is important to accurately track the success of the reintroduction program. However, identifying animals by eye can be time consuming and inaccurate. This ID recognition was done through Hotspotter and also by human observers. Hotspotter works to assist human observers in identifying individuals which match the reference images or already complete images of the same individual. Software relies on a large database picture for more accurate match for greater variation to confirm images enabling the algorithm to adjust alternate angle. We set up six cameras in different phase stations to collect footage to be used for identification of each individual. We photograph each individual with their left and right flag spot to create a deer from the folder for a better recognition. Over six weeks, we recorded 90 viable pictures with 118 images of the deer, where one flag of the individual was clearly seen. With those 118 images, the hotspotter software identified a known individual of 66 pages with a proportion of 3.56 or on 93 occasions with a proportion of 0 0.79 countries. There were 48 images where software and human observers agreed upon the identification of individuals. A occasions where, where there are different identifications and the occasions where a hot identified an individual or a human observer were not able. With a total of 14 images, human observers and hot spotter was not able to identify properly the individuals which are and 38 times when the human observer identified the individual which couldn't be identified from the software. We, could, we can agree that we successfully matched 7 out of 9 individuals across the numerous countries. In agreement with our human observer, 59% of the time, only 10% of the 
to split between software and image. It also managed to identify the views of 12% of the images, which could not be identified by the key author. In contrast, the software was unable to match two individuals to any of the chief consistent 36 images, which were inanimately identified by our human observers with a relative high level of confidence. 77 was an average for its percent of confidence in the identification. However, there was a decline in the software recognized to match the individual as the quality of the image to flight. The decent placement of the camera plays an important role in the recognition of the individual. The use of what's called as an animal information software has shown big results, mostly positive. However, this software is a useful tool to reduce the time required to identify individuals. When population sizes are uncertain, it is necessary to keep track of each individual's fate. The adoption of GPS and telemetry techniques is limited to the financial and human resources constraints. The use of camera jobs for photo identification is relatively new in the wildlife for wildlife research. Selecting whether photo ID is suitable method for population and territory for the species and which software to be used is dependent largely on the specific on the species biology and habitat use. We intend to explore this further with Russell Fred, collecting more images for higher resolution camera top across a greater number of individual habitat and when before comparing several already software to see which provides a solution for user friendliness and matches success and adaptability for a real world use. Thank you. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Clarel and I am a second year PhD student actually and in this virtual meeting of the ATBC it's a pleasure to share you a part of my research result which focuses on the discrimination of free uh, Madagascar commercial volume Dalberia species using near infrared spectroscopy. The context Rosewood and the palisander of Madagascar have been overlooked for several years to supply the illegal timber market. And one of the main trouble is that control officers are unable to identify the species when they are in front of logs or processed timber because the identification of these species is actually only possible from the morphological analysis of their flowers and leaves. So this raises the interest of developing tools to help identify them only from their wood, like the use of a near infrared spectroscopy. Until now, some researches on species discrimination using NIRS has been conducted for several years by the team and compared to previous studies we carried out, uh, this uh, study focuses on the discrimination of large diameter Dalbergia trees uh, with more wood samples. And so the objective of this study was to assess to, uh, the potential of a portable uh, NIRS spectrometer to discriminate uh, free di large diameter uh, Dalbergia species from their hair to wood spectra. Uh, to achieve this objective, first of all, uh, 43 wood cores belonging to the free species were collected in several forest areas at different regions of Madagascar, and the wood core uh, were then stabilized at 12% of humidity to avoid the effect of wood moisture variation on the spectra. And then C spectra were measured on the hair to wood of each core samples by using a portable via the Micronil spectrometer. And the spectra replicates were then averaged to get one spectrum per sample. And finally, uh, the spectra were uh, pre processed using several pre processing methods. And the spectra, uh, after that, the spectral data was then randomly divided into calibration data set and validation data set. And then partial least square discriminant analysis was carried out uh, using the soft, uh, Kimflow software in order to correlate the calibration spectral data with the reference data to develop the discrimination model. And finally, the best discrimination model was tested to identify the spectra belonging to the validation data set. And the model was evaluated by the percentage of well classified uh, spectra during the validation step. Uh, the result of the model uh, are resumed in this uh, in this confusion matrix, which show the reference classes in columns and the classes predicted by the model in rows. 
So for example, uh, we had five samples of Dalbergia graviana in the validation set, where four was well classified by the model and one was misclassified as, uh, as Dalbergia chlorocarpa. So uh, the result shows that the model can separate the free Dalbergia species with an overall percentage of well classified sample of uh, 80, uh, 84%. And uh, the model Dalbergia chlorocarpa with 100% accuracy. Uh, we can say that the result is promising despite of the intervention of several external parameters, such as the instability of the reference data, uh, because the taxonomy of Dalbergia of Madagascar is still under revision uh, actually. And regarding to the wood characteristics, the number of samples was a bit imbalanced between the three species, which could influence the variability of the spectra between species and could affect their uh, identification accuracy. And compared to previous studies, our result accuracy is a bit lower than those of other studies in the reiterator. However, this study tried to discriminate species belonging to the same genus. As a conclusion, results show that NIR can be a helpful tool to identify rosewood and palisander of Madagascar, but additional work should be carried out in order for an uh, everyday identification. So, as a main perspective, uh, as the project is in progress at the moment, we will recalibrate the model by adding more samples uh, to minimize the, this imbalance in number of uh, samples between the classes and also using over classification methods. So thank you for your attention. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good night maybe. I really enjoy these 12 exciting presentations on, on new ways uh, of looking at conservation science. And I can tell you, this is completely different than when I started my, my tropical work in the 1980s. So uh, I'm very excited about all these new things. Um, a lot on bioacoustics, a lot on, on, on in fact, on high tech, on, on Facebook and, and FB, that's my initial. So, so whenever they talk about FB, Facebook, then I think about myself and that's, that's so confused, but that's it. That's interesting. So uploading things and then putting things into uh, central databases, that's, that's, um, that's one of the big issues of today. Um, we have, uh, I would first would like to thank all the presenters for their really exciting presentations. And I, I, I again, I really enjoyed it. And I see there's a lot of energy of doing things and, uh, and also advancing things which are complicated. I mean, getting all these things together, that's not an easy thing to do. So we had several questions in the question and answer. Um, some of them are being, have been answered already. And I see now that there are two open questions. And the first one is quite interesting already because it's a question from Anuma Pereira to Mr. Rahman uh, from Japan. And then Yiran Fan would like to answer this one. So I would, would, would want to welcome Yiran Fan to answer this or to comment on this one and then see what uh, Raman uh, is going to answer himself. And the question is this, it's about these, these uh, LIDAR uh, analysis on the, on the trees in, the, in Japan and why they did not select cloud cover mist as a factor to determine tree height. So that's, an, that's a, a, a missing factor, and, and that's a choice at the end of the day. So could I invite you down to, uh, to unmute? Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, come in, come in. Yes. Oh, but actually, it's kind of awkward because I'm so sorry. I pressed the button by mistake. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's that's why I'm, I, I yeah, but still it's exciting. I mean, if if it's a question for somebody else, so don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. Sorry. Do you have any comments on this? Oh uh, no, sorry. Then thank then you. I would like. To, okay, thank you. Then I would like to ask uh, Faradur Rahman. Uh, 
from your plan to, to answer this one on on the the selection. In fact, it's about the selection of the factors to to uh, determine three items. I'm not sure if it's here. I don't see him in the in the in the in the system that I can see. So is that no? Then maybe late one is coming back. Okay, then I'll go to another question. Oh, the other one is also answered already. So that's about it. So what you can do is put individual questions to individual people, and then they can answer by email, by email, or in the in the chat, or in the question and answer. Um, okay. Thank you, Paula, Joanna. I mean, so are there other any other questions? Specific questions. I, I can imagine that, that 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 many of you are working on, on several things. For instance, the bioacoustics. There were three presentations on bioacoustics: Borneo, vertical structure, bad responses. I mean, if you don't know each other yet, this is the chance to get to know each other and connect. I'll say something really quick. Uh, just it's it's embarrassing. Yeah. The website's down. It just like yesterday, so it's super untimely issue, but. Uh, the Connect and Conserve initiative will be back up soon. And it's also, it's an alpha phase, right? So it's it's not even fully functional as is. Um, when we do get, I mean, there'll be a contact and like a subscription uh, option for people to get engaged. Send me, uh, if, if you are managing an organization, you can um, access that and, and, and contact me and get your organization up. But we're looking for people to basically to help us get out of alpha version, to, to move, to validate the data, to move forward. So. Although very untimely that it's not up, um, it will be up soon. So please do check back. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, I I, I think that's quite exciting. This whole connected concern thing, and that's specifically on conservation issues. But recently on restoration, there is this a similar initiative uh, by the Crowder Lab in Zurich, who is connecting and collecting uh, a restoration projects from all over the world with, with so the same doing... general idea of connecting. Yes. And that's yeah, that's so just I, I think be, it started last year. Sorry, sorry. Uh, restoration that would be included in our definition of conservation, uh, which we actually are. I, oh, yeah. I have a publication about to come out that's define redefining conservation and bounding it, so we can actually analyze it as objectively. Yeah, but so that's it, it'll get everything in there. We can have have like fun word clouds to just show how many people are doing like just restoration versus in situ yeah. conservation versus everything else. It's kind of fun. Well, that's a, that's very cool, and, and yeah, please contact these other groups. And, and I also know that there are groups in Brazil who are who are doing similar things in restoration projects. And so, so there is there is one way or another. There is this upsurge of bringing people together, and that's of course that because all the possibilities are there at the moment. And and, and that's a, it's it's not an easy task, eh? Because I, I saw that you have six thousand organizations mapped already. And that's that. Yeah, that's, that's quite a bit. We're, we're missing more, so it will only grow. What was the name of the restoration group that you're talking about? Uh, that is from Tom Crowther. Tom, Tom Crowther in University of uh, Zurich, ETH. ETH in Zurich in Switzerland. That's a group. I mean, it's, a group. it's not him only, but it, that's a whole group around. It's called Restore. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Yes. And if you want to know more about the restoration activities in, in that sense, in the um, in Brazil, you can contact Pedro Brancalion. He is going to be a panelist, I think, tomorrow afternoon or maybe it's Friday. So that's an, that's another thing. Are there any other questions? Scott, can you write the address of your web page? Okay, that that can be done by by mail, I think. Can I can I ask a question? Yes, of course. And we only have one minute left. So please, a short question and a short answer. Yes, I wanted to ask Joana Paula da Silva Oliveira about the Biomiteca in Atlantic Forest. And I think this project is really interesting and like a really powerful tool if, you know, when it gets to get working. Um, what do you think, what do you envision could be like the most challenging part to, to make this website and tool uh, working, you know, uh, get started? 
Hi, Tatiana. Thank you for a question. And um, I think the most difficult part will be when we have to actually achieve those people that are on the field, uh, that are farmers and traditional communities, so they can understand the value of the biodiversity that is all over around them. So that policies can be made so this kind of information can be sustainably applied. And, and with that, I also um, take advantage of this time I'm speaking to answer a question that was by, let me see, Alejandra. And she said that she's worried that the platform will promote biodiversity exploitation. And that's a double-edged sword because as I, as I am seeing in all over the, um, the event of ATBC events, there is no silver bullet for the problems that we face. So uh, I guess uh, this is an effort of putting together bioeconomic information with uh, models that can, that can explain how endangered and how vulnerable those species are so that all the public and people that cultivate and policymakers can uh, put the pieces together and this information can be out there because I think public opinion on those subjects is also very important. So I guess aggregating all this information is going to be uh, the most difficult part, but that's our aim. So. Yeah. Yeah, we are aiming for, for the difficult. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for pointing this out. In, in, in reality, of course, it is quite complicated. There is an opportunity to, for, to continue discussing in, in WOA um, and also in direct connection. If you, are in, you have downloaded the app, then that is relatively easy. We have to shut down at the moment because in like six minutes, the, the next um, um, meetings will start and uh, we have to go for a cup of coffee before. So thank you all very much. Thank you all the presenters. Thank, thank you all the participants who were there. Thank you, Zach Zahavi, for uh, making this all possible or helping to make this all possible. And I think this is really exciting and please go on with your exciting work. And I look forward to see more results also in the, in the, in the publications and next year live. Thank you very much for being here and to have a great day.